from our smallness and inconsequence. Except that you called us to worship you in spirit and in truth. You have dignified us with love and loyalty. You have lifted us up with your loving kindnesses. Therefore, we're told to come before you without, without grumbling, although we should ourselves before you. And without fear, though we often are anxious. We sing with spirit and pray with courage because you have dignified us. You have redeemed us from the aimlessness of, of things going meaninglessly well. God, lift the hearts of those for whom this holiday is not just a diversion, but perhaps a painful memory and a continued deprivation from those we love. Bless those whose dear ones have died needlessly or wastefully, as it sometimes seems in accidents or misadventures in this world. On this day, we remember with compassion those who have died serving their country in combat and around the world. All of us must address the questions of death in our lives and within our lifetime. We believe that you will provide for us as others have been provided with the fulfillment of those words from Jesus. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Lord, may your will be done within our country and within our world. We pray this in the mighty yet compassionate name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Let us begin together singing hymn 133, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to be reading from the Word of God today from Luke 3, 1 through 21. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform a miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into the mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with anyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked? You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do not understand these things. I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then? Will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may wonder, why does a preacher always have to grab the water before he starts? I'm trying to make sure it's not a dry sermon. Oh. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Preacher humor, preacher humor, it's an alert. 
You know, if you uh, if you look, if you were to look at my business cards, what you would find is that they don't say Kevin Drain. What they say is W Kevin Drain. Now, oftentimes people see my card and they say, oh, well, what does the W stand for? And I look at them and say, well, I think it stood for whoops. My sister's 10 years older than I am, and so, uh, obviously that's not true. The W actually stands for Walter, which was my dad's name, and so I tended to go by Kevin, and dad was Walter Wayman Dream. Well, blessed to have a sister that was 10 years older than I was, but I was pretty well reminded, not mentioning in any names, Brenda, that I was a whoops child, you know, 10 years. My mom and dad, Bonnie and Walt, treated, never treated me like a, a whoops. I was loved. Blessed to grow up in a loving home, parents that loved me, and with the big six that I was blessed with as well. Most of us have had good and memorable childhood experiences. We were born into families that were loving and supportive. Sometimes people's stories are a bit more tragic. For example, in 1952, a, a probation officer in New York City tried to find an organization that would assist in the adoption of a 12-year-old boy. And although the child had a religious background, none of the major denominations would assist with the adoption. The probation officer said later, his case had been reported to me because he'd been true. I tried for a year to find an agency that would care for this needy youngster. Neither the Catholic or Protestant or Jewish institutions would take him because he came from this denomination that they didn't recognize. I could do nothing constructed for him. You know, if the real principles of Christianity and Christian love had prevailed in the Bronx in 1952, perhaps a, a good home could have been found for that young, mixed-up boy. In fact, providing a, a better a loving and a supportive environment, that young man may have actually changed history. For you see, the boy, his name was Lee Harvey Oswald. He was the man charged with the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Maybe just being adopted and, and finding a, a loving, supportive home would have changed his life and saved the lives of who knows how many others. Well, we're going to look at today's scriptures, as Mark read earlier, from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. We're going to look at those and see what God has to say to us on this day, this Memorial Day. It begins, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. Okay, so I made it through the first verse. Pharisees, the Pharisees were this group of people who, um, well, they were a social movement. Uh, they had a particular school of thought that they believed in. The ruling council that this verse mentions was the Sanhedrin. And so what do we know about Nicodemus? We know he was a Pharisee, so he was very much into the law of Moses, Mosaic law. We also know he was a leader within Israel because he was part of the ruling council, the Sanhedrin. 
the same, same Sanhedrin that presented Jesus with an illegal trial that night. That was the Sanhedrin, the same group. Well, in verse 2. He came up to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. So Nicodemus is being appropriately complimentary, right? He's, he's opening the conversation by paying Jesus a compliment. That, you know what, Rabbi, we know you're of God because nobody else could do this. Perhaps. Well, the question is, why did we have that phrase, at night, thrown in there? Why did Nicodemus come to visit Jesus at night. Well, perhaps that's the only time they could get their, their day planners, their, their, their schedules to go inside. That's possible, but I doubt it. My thoughts are that Nicodemus wanted to come under the cover of darkness because he didn't want other people to know that he was meeting with this young rabbi, this upstart, this Jesus. Well, so Nicodemus is appropriately common, complimentary toward Jesus. And in, in verse 3, it says, In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. And i got to stop there because when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, or verily, verily, I say to you, that would be in our culture like me stopping and going, you need to hear this. Or pay attention now, because I'm about to give you something really good, right? And that's what Jesus is doing here. When he says, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, Nicodemus has got to be sitting there thinking, wait a minute, where did we derail? I paid Jesus these compliments, said he must have been a man of God, and all of a sudden he's talking about the kingdom of God. I never brought it up. Where did this come from? Why is Jesus jumping into this topic? But Nicodemus sticks with him and says, uh, how can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asks, surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Nicodemus is staying in this phys physical or literal world. He can't make the jump or, or comprehend anything else other than the literal meaning that Jesus is referring to. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Again, I tell you the truth. So when Nicodemus hears this, he knows here's another big statement coming. I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Verse 9, Nicodemus says, how can this be? In verse 10, you are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. Verse 12, I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? 
No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Wow. Wow. Yeah, Jesus had a lot, a lot to say in this short bit of scripture. First, let's unpack some of this verse. What does it mean when it talks about as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert? Well, we can go to Numbers in the Old Testament, the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 5 through 8. And this is what it says. They spoke against they, being the people of Israel. They're coming out of Egypt, right? Moses is leading them toward the promised land. So this is the people of uh, Israel, the Hebrews. It says, they spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Could have also said to die in the desert, right? There is no bread. There is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Verse 6, then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. We like snakes. <laughs> yeah. Not so many in our culture. Verse 7, the people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. Did they get what they wanted? No. No. God didn't take the snakes away. Here's what God did. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can then look at the snake and will live. So when it refers to just as Moses lifted the snake in the desert, this is the story it's talking about. A time when God's people were rebellious, stiff-necked, Complaining, whining, why did you bring us here, Moses? And in saying that, they were saying the same thing about God. Well, Moses did. He made this bronze snake, and he put it on a pole, and the people were still getting bit by these venomous snakes. <laughs> and yet they would look at the bronze snake on the pole, and they would not die. They would live. And so when it says that Jesus, too, would be lifted up, the analogy was is that as Jesus was on the pole, on the cross, that the people would look to the cross and find life. Amen? Amen. Whatever happened to that snake? Well, funny you should ask, because I'm about to tell you. That snake, that bronze snake, went into the archives. I mean, you don't just throw a bronze snake like that away or sell it at the garage sale, right? Until King Hezekiah. And King Hezekiah had that bronze snake shattered into bits and pieces. Why, you might ask? Well, again, funny that you would ask that. Because the people during Hezekiah's time began to worship the bronze snake. And that's a pitfall that we as a church need to be careful of as well. That we have these customs and traditions and rituals, and we begin to worship them rather than worshiping the God behind them. Amen? Okay, now you've been updated on the snake. Think about it. This whole concept, this, 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 this scripture is about being born again. It's about rebirth.
Richard Spruce tells of a Malaysian sailor who asked an interesting question one day. He said, how is it that almost every animal except man renews its beauty and youth at stated seasons or times throughout its life? He went on. Birds molt their plumage. Snakes slough off their skin. Even cockroaches cast off their old covering and all bring forth this new, bright, beautiful outer appearance as in the days of their youth. But not human beings. Casting his eyes on his brown and wrinkled hands, this Malaysian sailor said, Human beings, we seem to grow older and sometimes not nearly as attractive as in our youth. It's an interesting point, don't you think? Why is it that the animals and the species molt or slough off their skin? They, they regenerate. They have this rebirth. But the reality is, even though we don't get a, a, a nice new appearance periodically throughout our life, at least not without surgery, <laughs> we get something that's better. Because you see, we have an opportunity in a new heart. And with that new heart comes a new birth and a new family and a new kingdom and an opportunity to live in that kingdom with God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and our brothers and sisters in Christ, we get to live there forever. Glory. So which would you rather have? The opportunity to renew this outward appearance or to renew this? Well, the answer is easy, isn't it? If this were Hollywood Squares, we'd say, uh, I'll have eternal life for 50, or excuse me, Jeopardy, Alex. <laughs> Sorry. What could be my mind? Well, back to our scriptures. Verse 16. For God so loved the world, probably one of the most popular or known verses within our entire Bible. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 17. Pretty awesome as well. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Believe in Jesus and you will not be condemned. Amen? Amen. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. What does that conjure up when you hear this is the verdict? Instead of the front of the sanctuary, I, I conjure up that here's the bench and the judge is up there. And here I stand, awaiting. The trial's over. This is the verdict. Right? So it says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Verse 20, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. 21, but whoever lives in the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen Plainly, that what he has done has been done through God. Yeah. Do 
so many of us as children. We're born fearful of the dark, right? I mean, I know, I ask at a lot of funerals, huh, who's afraid of the dark? Or who was afraid of the dark? And usually it's just me and a couple others, and everybody else is willing to throw the three of us under the bus. But most kids go through a period of time when they're fearful of the dark. What a shame that as adults, we can't be fearful of the darkness of evil. Right? Oh, that we would continue to be programmed toward the light. Well, let's think about this a moment. So, so Jesus says here to Nicodemus, what he's saying is actually quite focused and poignant. We tend to think like Nicodemus in the literal. Well, he's talking about literal birth and then a spiritual birth. And so he's talking about a water baptism, the baptism that we receive, versus a spiritual baptism, a baptism of the Holy Spirit. We must be born again. That's what it all means. But even though that is all correct, there's one more avenue that you need to think about. Think about the culture that Jesus and Nicodemus were part of. Within the culture of Israel, within the Judaism, Nicodemus and Jesus both knew and grew up that prosperity within Israel it was all based upon the family you were born into. Now, I'm not talking about, oh, you were born into a rich family. I'm talking about the family you were born into. All the Jews were born into the family of Abram. Abram. Remember the song, right? Father Abraham, it says, many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Anyhow, if you were a Jew, the family you were so delighted to be a part of was to be an ancestor of Abraham. Because if you were an ancestor and part of the family of Abraham, then you were God's chosen. And so this is another avenue we need to think about as we read this scripture. The Jewish people had a bit of an attitude, a little bit of arrogance that went with them. And that, well, I'm a Jew and God's chosen and you aren't. So there are Jews and there are Gentiles. And never the two shall meet. And what Jesus is saying here is, guess what? There's a new deal. It doesn't matter how you've been born, physically and or as a descendant of Father Abraham. God is starting a new family. And it's not enough that you've been just born a Jew. You also will need to be born again into God's family. Not just the family of Abram. Well, kind of a big deal. The point of this passage is that it's kind of a double-sided thing, this new birth. Not only is it talking about beyond the physical, but it's also talking about being beyond God's chosen, the Jewish people. And Jesus says, it is so important that if you believe in me, you'll have eternal life. And if you don't, sorry. If you don't, you won't have eternal life. When you're reborn in the Spirit, there's a new life of the Spirit that wells up in us like a spring of water inside you. It's a spiritual baptism. It's the thing that says, not only am I Christ, but I just can't do enough in my life to be like Christ. 
Jesus went on in this very scripture and said, without that spiritual rebirth, you can't even see God's kingdom. That's what he said. You won't even see God's kingdom, let alone be in it. Well, I started today talking about loving families and the sad story of Lee Harvey Oswald who needed adopted and placed in a supportive, loving family and environment. Here's a fact for you. You may not like this, but, but the family that you were raised in, regardless of how good it is, will not hold a candle to being a part of the family of God. Oh, can he say that? He doesn't know how good my family was. I know this. I know God's family is going to be just the most awesome. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Oh, to be in the family of God. There was a woman, very busy church worker, she was waiting for D.L. Moody because D.L. Moody had just shared with this, this group of church workers some very plain truths from God. Because he was preaching from God's word. And she wasn't very happy about this. She wasn't happy at all. And when Mr. Moody finally came down off of the, the stage... This angry woman said, Mr. Moody, do you mean to tell me that I, an educated woman, taught from childhood in the ways of the church, and all my life interested in the church and doing good, good deeds, that I must enter the kingdom of heaven the same way the worst criminals of our day are going to enter the kingdom of heaven? Is that what you're saying? And Dwight Moody said, no, ma'am. It's not what I'm saying. It's what God is saying. It's what Jesus is saying. And we need to remember that as well. What is it that God and Jesus are saying to us? Jesus today said, you must be born again. Born not this time into the rushing, the Washburn, the Hafner, the Drain, the Clevenger family, right? You must be born into the family. Friends, you must believe in Jesus, be born again, if you are to enter the kingdom of God. Be a part of the family of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Soon and very soon, number seven.
And it's so wonderful to hear the word today and that we can be born again. You are God Almighty, creator of all things, and yet you care about each of us. We are your We thank and praise you, Lord, for the delights of our lives, the blessings that you freely give. All we have to do is look around us at the children, at the smiling faces, at those we love, and those we don't even know that are looking back at us with those beautiful eyes. We thank you for all of the gifts that you have given us. And we thank you even for those birthdays. We've got a lot of birthdays we're celebrating this month, and we just thank you for, for those celebrations and those birthdays. We thank you for the graduations that our children have been going through. It's amazing the work that they do, and now they can just enjoy the fact that they have accomplished much. We thank you, Lord, for those who have fought and died for our country. We praise them that they may honor you and that you will be putting your arms around them now as they join you in the miraculous heaven that you have promised us. But there are many here on earth, Lord, that remain that are hurting. We have so many that are needing your love and healing touch. As your word, James 5, instructs us, we lift each to you in prayer those that are battling cancer, those that are having mental illnesses, those who are looking for future tests and waiting for results, those who have are just broken, Lord, who have addictions. All of these, no matter whether they're suffering spiritually, physically, emotionally, we ask that you give them love and you put your loving hand upon them. Bring them healing, forgiveness, hope, and peace in their bodies and in their spirit. Pastor Kevin's message today in our scripture lesson made me realize that, like the lawyer Nicodemus, we also come to you in the darkness, in hidden ways. We have lots of concerns and questions. We aren't sure that you will even listen to them or that you will think our questions are maybe silly, and so we won't even ask. But being born again, new life, sounds wonderful. We have made very big messes in our lives. Some we have cleaned up, but others that we have, we have simply swept under the rug, hidden away in the closet, hidden from ourselves even. And some we believe are even hidden from you. But you know us better than we know ourselves. And you know our thoughts and actions. And so we pray, help us, Lord. How can we turn things around so that there is peace and hope? Today we offer you these concerns of our families, our community, and our nation. But so often we really don't expect anything and will change. We are unwilling to change ourselves and so we'll change the world appears a wispy dream that will never be seen. But we know that it can be changed in you. So we pray, Lord, that you will bring your presence powerfully to us. Convince us of the hope that rests in you alone. And we thank you and we praise you and we honor you. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. For he said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So maybe, maybe you are, uh, are out there in broadcast land, 
and wondering, you know, I, I really, really want to believe in Jesus. I really want to take that next step. What should I do, Pastor? Well, you know, if we were having church services, we, we would always welcome people at our, our altar. I have a mobile number. Feel free to call me if I can help you in any way, shape, or form. But the most important thing for you to do isn't to call me, it's to call God. And you don't need a cell phone, you don't need a certain calling plan. All you need to do is pray. Pray to God. And ask God to help you be the son or daughter that God wants you to be. You don't need me as an intercessor, though I would be delighted to help and to answer any questions. What you need is to believe in Jesus and to go to that, that Savior and our Father God and the Holy Spirit. Seek their guidance and give them your life. If you've enjoyed our service today, thank you. Thanks for being with us again. Uh, if you go to our website, kiwanaumc.com, there's ways to give if you are so inclined. We so appreciate those of you who are, who are giving so we can continue our ministry here. And uh, continuing our ministry, when is, when is church going to be open, Pastor? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. You know, we hope uh, next Sunday, but don't hold your breath on that. I, I really, really doubt that that's going to occur. Um, Bishop Beard has instructed us that he'll let us know. And Bishop Beard is listening to the governor and, and all the science. So here we go. Thanks for joining us this week. In the name of God the Father and Jesus Christ, his holy and perfect Son, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, let us be lifted up by these words of encouragement from our Jesus. Go in peace, go in love. Amen and amen.